just to give some context, just for those who are watching this on the internet and are not aware, just during our connection time, uh, uh, five of us, uh, no, four of us, uh, decided it would be a great idea to get soaked for children in need. Thank you to all of you who contributed in your uh, water throwing techniques. Uh, let this be known now that um, revenge is sweet. It may say in the Bible it belongs to the Lord, but sometimes he does use us. Now, it was a brilliant time, uh, just to give you that context, if we make some reference uh, during this uh, uh, sermon. And it was cold. Right, let's pray, shall we? So, Lord... We want to ask and give you thanks uh, for your greatness, for your goodness. Thank you for what we've heard and sung and worshipped you so far this morning. Lord, thank you that you've heard our prayers in regards to recent events in Europe. Lord, we pray now as we look at your word, as we, we, we go back to basics, Father, we ask that uh, you will soak us in your spirit and teach us in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, who was, um, who was here last week? Marvellous. What did we look at? Mark. And we're going to look at Mark again. Yay! So, uh, what did we learn last time? Can anybody remember what we learned last week? Anybody? Do you learn anything? That's good going. Thank you, Jane. That Mark doesn't mess about, he gets straight down to it. Yeah, Mark is definitely one of those Gospels that he's straight down to it, no mucking about. This is what it looked like. Bang, 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 bang. No floweriness in his uh, narrative at all. What do we learn about Jesus, what he did? What about time in the synagogue? He's there preaching and all of a sudden... Man possessed comes flying forward. Does Jesus sort of drag him off slightly to one side and go, we'll have a word with you later? Do you remember that? Now, what did he do? He just went, bang, come out of him. Cut the guy dead. No mucking about. Not having that in this meeting. Dosh. Sorry, I'm going to use sort of language I tend to use a lot more than... Uh, just dealt with him. None of this... Oh. I'll have a meeting with you later. It was like, no, nah, this needs sorting. I can see something here that nobody else can see. This is not some gobby bloke. This is Satan at work. That's what I like about Mark. He's to the point. The reason this is back to basics is because we can think so convolutedly uh, about God and our walk with him, and, and there's a place for that. But there's times I think we've got to remember the absolute, this is it. Do you remember the other thing was that Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit, yes? Remember his baptism? He did everything in the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't do it in his own power. He didn't do it as the divine son of God. He did it as a human being in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a distinct difference. The reason we need to know that difference is because it means that we're all filled with the Holy Spirit. We can do the same as our Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to know that. If you don't know that, then everything you read in the Bible and what Jesus did and what the disciples did is going to mean absolutely nothing to you in your walk. Because the disciples picked it up. They went, oh, we do this in the power of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus did. If he's meant to be the absolute example of the perfect human, we need to look at that. So just that we mentioned that. So what are we? We left it. We left the fact that at the end of uh, verse 28, that G people were amazed at Jesus' teaching. They're amazed that it was backed up with the power. Remember this, Mark has a very much proclamation. Jesus preaches the good news and then backs up what he's saying with power, with miracles. And I'm saying, I simply think, I think that's something chunk of us miss within churches the fact that actually we may talk the good news, etc. But there is that power to back that up. So what we are saying is backed up by, by miracles. So 
So, you know, you might be able to turn around to somebody who's got a bad back in your workplace and you're chatting to them. And actually, we sometimes go, I'll pray that about that for you and start walking away. Well, actually, maybe sometimes we should go up and say, you know, can I pray for you now? And do the prayer that actually might heal that back on the spot. Jumping ahead of myself slightly, but that's... I found myself caught short this week. I was almost going to say to somebody, I'll pray about that for you. And then I found myself, no, I need to pray with them. I actually need to pray now. There is healing for them. I've got no idea if it's happened or not. um, But you never know. But if you don't try, it's not going to happen in the first place. Anyway, so this is about back to basics. And we start again with verse 29 to 31. After Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, by the way, we're in the same day. Jesus has basically been uh, uh, started his church one day. He started the disciples. He then goes off on to a Sabbath day to go in preaching the synagogue, cast out a demon. People are amazed and gripped, and it's the same day. So after Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. Now, Simon's mother in law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her sit up. The fever left her, and she prepared a meal for them. And I realize I've not told you, Remark chapter 1, verse 29. Mark chapter 1, verse 29. I apologize. Uh, it's still not working. Um, we've had technical problems all morning. There's one point I looked at Subana and just went... Not at Subana, but at the fact it's not working. Not his fault, just at the fact the uh, stuff is not working. So, after a great church service with no technical problems, Jesus walks with Simon, who will be Peter, and Andrew's home. And they come across Simon, Peter, in brackets for now, um, Uh, to the home there where the mother-in-law is. So after a great uh, church service, they go home for a roast dinner or rice and peas or curried goat or in my case, it would be a cheese and coleslaw sandwich with cheesy Doritos. (laughs) Or is it a chilli? No, it's chilli, isn't it? Oh, we're having chilli. No, it's that Joy's back, so I'm actually going to eat properly now. Um, so they go to Simon and uh, Simon Peter and Andrew's house with James and John. And upon arrival, it is Simon's mother-in-law. Note that it's Peter's mother-in-law who's sick. Means he's married. We have such an illusion sometimes that they just walked around as single men following Jesus. No, they were married. They had responsibilities. So it makes you think of some of the stories. Well, they didn't quite just walk off all the time. And you see that in the, uh, in the Corinthian letters when Paul writes and he's talking about, well, you need to support Peter and his family. They went with them sometimes. So just to give you that concept. So it's his mother-in-law who's sick. I'm not doing any mother-in-law jokes, I can assure you. But they want to say, could you go up? So Jesus goes upstairs or wherever to her bedroom and he heals her. Notice the practical bit first. He helps her up. And it's as he helps her up, she is healed. I'm not going to go into all the details, but he just walks up and it's his compassion for her that helps her. It's his compassion authority in the spirit that restores her back to full health. Now we'll just sit there and say, yep, Jesus heals. We know that. Great, he's healed her. Question is, what's her response? How does she respond? Anybody who's got a Bible open, how does she respond? She actually carries on as normal. She carries on as normal. She gets up and prepares... A meal for them all. Chili. She gets up and she prepares 
a meal. She serves the household. Now, this for me is interesting. It's not that I think she just gets up and does. She goes back into normal, but she actually serves them, I think, out of gratefulness as well, not just obligation. It'd be so easy, I think, for someone. We just recover from something. We just think, oh, I just want to stretch this out for another day, not having to do any housework. Let me, let me just see if I can just stretch this out. And, you know, I need to fully recuperate. You know, I need to get completely over this and, and stop nodding at me, Joy, with that look that says, what housework? You don't do any. But, you know, oh, just, just another 24 hours I need. And I agree with that, funnily enough, in the workplace. There are times, I think, some people suddenly think they're better from a workplace and then try to go straight back to work full time. And I actually need another day to fully recover. Just thought I'd throw that in there. But, I'm not talking about me here, I'm just talking that as a practical thing for most of us. I think we need to think practically sometimes. But here for me, what she's doing, she's, she's actually wanting to serve Jesus and the rest of the family and the rest of the disciples and, and her son-in-law out of actually gratefulness. She's thankful for Jesus that she has been released from an illness. She's no longer ill. She's been healed. She has been touched by Jesus. And so now, what's her proper response? I want to serve Jesus. I think there is some of that we can see in there. I know that uh, this verse over the years has been used to uh, uh, place women in the role of housemaid almost, but that's a complete misreading of what's going on here. It wasn't that the boys just sat there and went, right, well, well done, Jesus, you've healed her so she can do the cooking. Great on you. wasn't that at all. I think there's an element here that she was also set free. And there's an element that she wants to do something out of gratefulness, not obligation. And that should be the same for us. That when we know we've been touched by Jesus, and if you know Jesus now and you are saved and you have the Holy Spirit living with you, you have been touched by Jesus. And you serve him out of gratefulness and thankfulness, not out of obligation. She's serving not just the family. She's almost serving the start of the Christian fellowship. She doesn't know that at that point, but I can see that. You can read some of that into there for me. Anyway, we're going to do what we always do with Mark, because Mark is, we're going to be quick with it. We're not going to hang around on everything. 32 to 34. That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. Well, after sunset, why after sunset? Well, it was Sabbath. And Sabbath was marked by Friday night sunset to Saturday evening sunset. So, and Jews were forbidden to travel or work during Sabbath. Ergo, they had to wait until sunset had gone before they could travel to the home. And what would be seen any work being done? But the good news of Jesus has spread quickly. Gospel became gossip. By the way, gossip wasn't actually a bad word once. Gossip actually meant good gossip. You know, you're just chatting to your mate, having a good old natter, how good, good old gossip. But these days, we've, because gossip is now used as nasty talk, it's not that. And it actually comes from this sort of God talk, gospel gossip. People are bringing the demon possessed and the sick to the door. And people are clamoring to watch. Could you imagine that? People cramming into the home. People clamoring to watch what's going to happen next. Oh, what's he going to do with this one? Can, can you get that in your head just for a minute? To try and explain, the home wasn't like here, a row of houses, and then there was like, you know, at number 14A Terrace, the Green Terrace Crescent, Greenford. That's where Peter lives. It, there were sort of a, homes were like in a quadrant. And the front doors faced to the inner quadrant. And you accessed the inner quadrant via like a little bit of portal, uh, like a bridge hole. And you would go from the village through the hole and then you'll be in the main area, in the main sort of quadrant. Are you with me? 
And therefore, that's the home. So people will clamor in there and go in there. And obviously, wherever Jesus was, but they're desperate to see. I can imagine people on, on things going, what was he doing over there then? Trying to see over everybody's heads. You would do, wouldn't you? If you know there's somebody who's going to heal people, send out demons, you'd be going nuts. You would. You'd be desperate. It'd be like wanting to see some rock band or some movie premiere or anything. You're desperate to see who it is. Oh, let me look. Oh, yeah, I got him. It's okay. My center of balance is fine. But why the command to silence? Jesus would not allow the demons to speak. As I said to you in Mark, there is a, a motif within the, the gospel about stating that people must be, the demons must be silent. They're not allowed to speak at all. And that's because Jesus knew exactly who he was. He knew his own identity. He knew that he was a servant of the Lord. He knew he was the son of God. But he also knew he, knew he was the Messiah. But he needed to keep the, his saviour type, anointed one identity secret. That's all Messiah means, his anointed one. He needs to keep that secret for now because he can't afford for a premature or false understanding of what it means to have God's Messiah amongst them. We see that in uh, Mark chapter 8. When Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter declares, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are correct, Peter, and the rest of the disciples. Well done. But they didn't have a clue what they meant by that. They thought they meant a warrior type Messiah, one who's going to drive out the Romans. Israel is going to be back to how it should be. Jerusalem will be free. We will govern our own land and no more trouble and all peace and wonder. That's what they thought it meant. And Jesus knows that's not what he meant. And what he couldn't afford was uh, for wrong uh, understanding. So hence, Jesus commands the demons, which is basically shut up. Not a word. <coughs> What's funny is the people were going to believe the demons. It's ironic, isn't it? You think about it. God sends his voice and his messenger. The people don't really believe it half the time because they don't follow it. But a demon says, oh, this is the Holy One of God. They're going to believe a demon. Remember, Mark uses some irony in his gospel. And they would have made Jesus king. They would have sort of, the people would have grabbed him and forced him to be king. And that really would have shut down Jesus' preaching ministry, his healing ministry. Because one of the key things that would happen is the Romans would have come to capture him early. Because there can only be one king for the Romans, and that was Caesar. So if that had gone widespread, that we've got a new king and he's called Jesus, they would have got it all wrong and it would have caused trouble. So this is Jesus' point of telling the demons... You know who I am, but silence. I can't afford for it to get wrong. Verse 39, uh, 35 to 39. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Well, that looks all very nice, doesn't it? Jesus slopes off, bit of quiet time, bit of quiet prayer. Something we say all the time. Something I try and say to everybody, no, you've got, you've got to take some time out, you know. Almost every day. Have some quiet time with God. Set yourself up for the day, you know. Yeah? Who does that? Who gets themselves at least sort of 10 minutes quiet time with God? Most days. I'm not, I live in the real world. And we say, wow, we take our example from Jesus. And we can understand that. But here is part of their misunderstanding. When it says here that he's gone off to an isolated place, it's the same word that's used for wilderness like he went off into the wilderness where he was tempted by satan 
So Mark is not using it to mean a desert-type place, but it's a place of repentance, restoration, and fellowship with God. Mark here is showing us that Jesus, after having a whirlwind of a time of casting out demons, preaching, and healing people, massive activity, that he needs to go and seek a still and quiet time with the Father. which is something we need to learn to do. We can have a real wild activity time and forget that actually we need 10 minutes, maybe downtime afterwards, half an hour, an hour, whatever it is. We need a place where we can just be with God to allow him to refresh us. I learned that lesson many years ago after... uh, uh, extensive time of preaching here that actually afterwards when everybody's I need just 10 minutes in my office on my own just with the father and that means all of us also in the work just going into normal workplace coming out afterwards need some time with the father I need to remember who my father is and my identity I need to be refreshed by him Jesus here cannot output unless he's got input from the Father. Again, do not think Jesus just walked around doing it all off his own strength and just was constantly on the go. He needed input from the Father so that he could output. Well, if Jesus needed it, how much more do we need it? But Mark is also showing us that Jesus is not some sort of hermit nor a busy bee doing everything. He's not a recluse and he's not a busy bee. There is a middle ground. He gets his identity from the Father and therefore he knows what he's meant to be doing for the Father. It's very important. What does that mean for us if we are meant to use Jesus as an example and he is meant to spend quiet time being with the Father, to get his identity from the Father, so he knows what he's then meant to be doing for the Father. What does that mean for us? The answer is fairly simple. We should be doing the same. We should be doing the same. We should be doing the same. And we do the same out of gratefulness for that we've been released, not out of obligation. Verse 36. Later Simon and the other, Simon, who was Peter, and others went out to find him. Well, that was good, wasn't it? A desperate to get hold of Jesus. This was not a casual act of, oh, should we go and find Jesus? Yeah, yeah, he's obviously just nipped off somewhere. Let's, let's go and see if we can find him, shall we? It's not that sort of, you know, like you lost him in Tesco's type thing, you know, which aisle is he down? Is he down that one? No. On to the next one, is he down that one? No. Can you see him up that end? No. It's not that at all. It wasn't a casual trying to find him. The Greek and the uh, word that's being here is actually a hunted. They pursued Jesus but not for the right reasons. This is a negative connotation that Mark is showing. It's a negative wording. They actually couldn't leave him alone, not because they thought he was the Messiah, but because he was this great miracle worker and they wanted to make sure they had hold of him. Do you understand what I mean? They have got him for themselves. This is a connotation that Mark is using here that they want to prevent him from completing his mission even though they don't know it. So when you look at it, I think, oh, look how they pursued after Jesus. They were so desperate to hear from him. No, they weren't. They were desperate to have control of him, to ensnare and capture him. It's that sort of hunting. Again, as I said, chapter eight, they've declared him the Messiah And when in chapter 8, Jesus then says, ah, but I must suffer, you get Peter going, no, you must not suffer. That can't be right. And that's when uh, Jesus has to say to him, get behind me, Satan. You have the things of men on your mind, not the things of God. It's the same thing here. 
It's their own mind and things of men on their mind here that they're pursuing down for Jesus, not because they want to know what God wants. And we would say what they're doing is right. But to quote, just because something seems a good thing to you doesn't mean it's a God thing to do. Just because something seems a good thing to you doesn't mean it's a God thing to do. Very important. We'll come back to that later. And then Edwards puts it, discipleship, this is discipleship that is attempting to control God's work, not following God's work. And we see it again here. Verse 37, when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. Again, 10 times in the New Testament, this negative, everyone's looking for you, this is a pursuing term. It is not a, a, a positive term. It's pursuing. It's negative in everything that it's saying. It's sort of, everyone's looking for you, Jesus, including us. Come on, come with us. What are you doing out here? Come back. It's that sort of term. It's almost like they want to grab him and go, come on. Got to carry on where we left off yesterday. And Edwards again denotes that this is an attempt to determine and control rather than submit and follow. And that has lots of things for us. It's very easy for us to decide and want to do something that God, we think, oh, God wants us to do this. Get on with it. I will basically tell God what he wants me, what he wants me to do. And this is what this is here. Come on, God, come to where I am at and work with me in what I am doing. It's all about me. Mark, for Mark, seeking Jesus is not a virtue. The word seeking in here, in Mark, is not a virtue. It's actually a negative. Edwards, here as elsewhere in Mark, enthusiasm is not to be confused with faith. Indeed, it can oppose faith. You might be really enthusiastic about something. You might have an enthusiastic passion for something. You might have something enthusiastically passionate about that's happening outside or a church function or something that's in the church or outside of the church. And you think this must continue and this must go on and it must do exactly what I've always been doing. Well, actually... We could, you could be preventing something that actually God wants to do by keeping something going. God might want to be doing something new, but that can't happen while the passion for the other thing is still going on because that is where one's identity rests, is in what I'm doing rather than what God wants me to do. I, it rests in what I'm doing rather than who God says I am. Do you get the point? Just because something seems a good thing to you doesn't mean it's a good thing to do. So this is what we got here. We got over exuberant passion, over exuberant enthusiasm, and it's overriding faith. It's overriding what God wants to do. It's actually hindering what God's to do, which quite frankly is more satanic in my view than anything else. Hindering something that God wants to do just because you're passionate about something else that does look good on the surface of it, but doesn't mean it's what God wants. It's not for God's glory and it's not for his kingdom. It may look like it to you, but doesn't mean it is. God has other things he wants us to do. And sometimes we have to be attentive to that, not attentive to our own passions and wants and desires. And this is Jesus' response to them. But Jesus replied, 
We must go to other towns as well. I love that. He's not bothering to respond to them and say, well, actually, no, 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 you've misunderstood. Let me, let me unpack this for you. Um, let me go and appease the people that are looking for me. Let me go and appease you. Let me make you feel a bit happy about it. He's just gone, no, actually, we've got to go to other towns as well. This is why I'm here. I love the way that Mark renders Jesus. It's just blunt and to the point. Wasn't rude, but just won't allow himself to be swayed by the crowd. Jesus stands against human expectation and gets on with what God wants him to do. So what does that mean for us as individuals and church? Deliberately a rhetorical question, because I want you to think about that for a minute. And then I want to note something else. Because we live in a very individualistic mindset society. It's all about me. If I've heard from God, it's got to be right. We've got to note something. Jesus was in perfect communication with the Father because he was sinless. He absolutely had straight line, one-to-one with the Father. So when Jesus heard from the Father, he knew that he was hearing right. He didn't have his own pride, expectations, didn't have a sort of sin blanking his way. He had direct communication. Well, we do not quite have that privilege. So sometimes we can think we've heard, we are hearing God for something, and we could be absolutely right. But we need to test it with others. That's why we are Jesus' body represented here as a church. And if you think you've heard something from God about yourself, about what you think should be going on, or where you should be, uh, God is saying to you, you need to test it with others. Yes? It's always a good idea to test it with people who actually will stand up to you and say, you're wrong. It's very easy to go to the people who will nod at you. You just chuck them your diatribe of language at them. And they go, yeah, 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 you're right. Or won't say anything. And you take that as correct. You need people who will stand up to you and say, you're wrong. I've got people like that in my life. Some of them are in this room right now. There are others outside of Greenford Baptist Church. You should see a leadership team meeting. Amen. Woo! You couldn't have got that time better if you tried, could you? <clears throat> Dennis and I practiced that. Um, see, the Lord speaks to us through many. Anyway, no, joking. But it's absolutely right. We don't have totally perfect. We have to test things. And actually, quite frankly, if you're humble enough to have something tested and people stand up to you, I'd say that's more of God than anything else. As long as you're willing to be challenged, that makes you more of a child of God than anything else. So you should be challenged when you think something's right. And I come back to this quote. Just because something seems a good thing to you doesn't mean it's a God thing to do. Just because something seems a good thing to you doesn't mean it's a God thing to do. 40 to 45. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can make you sorry, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Actually, no, that's no, I did that really lame, didn't I? He says, I am willing, he said, be healed. There's an exclamation mark in mind, it means he shouted it. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. 
Then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. So we end in verse 39, Jesus traveling throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. And here with Mark, between 40 and 45, he's taken what would look like one specific story during that time and sort of lumped it out and stuck it in here. Why is that? Well, Mark clearly wishes to show us show something to his readers. Firstly, faith is at play. Faith of the man with leprosy. Leprosy was a common term used for any skin disease. Sufferers had to stay away from anybody else. They were literally outcast from society. And when I say I make it sound like past tense, it is still current tense in other countries. If you suffer from any form of a skin disease that would be classed as leprosy, you end up in a leprosy colony. And I have seen one. You become a complete social outcast. You are to stay, I think it's, this is now from memory, it's about 10 metres away from people. This is in Jesus' time. And you're almost meant to be wrapped up completely and you walk around, uh, sometimes it was with a bell, or just at least saying, unclean, unclean, unclean. You have to shout that out? What are you identifying yourself as being? Unclean. You're reinforcing the fact that you are unclean. And it's not you're unclean just dirt-wise. You're unclean because you've been cursed by God, clearly. That's the understanding behind back in those times. So you're just reinforcing in yourself that you're unclean, that you're cursed by God. And it's a skin disease that we can cure today. So for this man to go up to Jesus, literally up to Jesus, and saying... You know, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He spoke to him. I mean, that was just breaking every cultural taboo under the sun, and especially to a rabbi. Yet he did it. And note his question, if you are willing. We know that God can heal today. Amen? Sometimes he's not willing to do it for greater reasons than we actually understand. But we do say that God can heal today. But I think we can actually prevent God from using us to heal people because we question the fact whether he's ever really willing. And we panic. And I wonder if we don't want to put ourselves out there. We don't want to be embarrassed if he doesn't do the healing. I could be wrong, but I wonder. Maybe it's just my own thinking that's been challenged over the years. Especially in the West, two and one and one equals two. Two and two equals four. Yeah? It's logical. Life is logical. It has to have an easier answer. It has to involve antibiotics. There's nothing wrong with that. God uses our modern day science. But he does do miracles. We have got testimonies in this church of people who went for ops and it's gone before the op could even start because people prayed. Why is my rheumatoid arthritis switched off? I have no idea, but I don't have it. Praise God. Do you get the point? God does heal. Sometimes he's not willing for bigger reasons but we need to be attentive and listen when we're there and maybe God is saying pray for healing step out it won't happen if we shut it down if we decide it's never going to happen it won't happen and then we go see I was right God doesn't heal today 
It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think we need to sometimes recapture that authority that has been given through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? As I said to you, Mark, for me, is about reclaiming ground and restoring hope, the vision statement of GBC. I think some of us need, I need it reclaimed in my own life, my own thinking when I am praying for people. So he can do that. So Jesus, moved with compassion, reaches out and touches him. Now, earlier texts don't have compassion. They have anger. Jesus moved by anger. The reason some later texts now have it down as translated as compassion is probably what they're saying is that copyists, when they took earlier manuscripts, would then copy and they would look and the idea of this all-loving Jesus being angry, oh, no, no, don't, don't like that. What we'll do is we change Jesus. But Jesus did get angry. He got angry enough to create a whip and drive people out of the temple. It's not anger for his own sake. It's righteous anger. It's like a godly anger. And Jesus most certainly used to get angry at those things that were damaging people. He wept at Lazarus' tomb because he died. He knew he was going to bring him up, but it was because of the fact that death was there. And that damages people, and that was not part of God's original plan. He was angry in the temple because they were hindering people coming to God. They were defiling the house of the Lord. He got angry here because there is a damaged person, not just damaged in the fact that he's got leprosy and he's ill, but damaged by this because he's been cast out from society. Doesn't get enough proper food because he's not involved. He's never going to heal, is he? If you don't get the right nutrients in your body. Jesus was angry. He wasn't angry at the leper. He was angry at the disease. He was angry because the individual was physically, emotionally, and spiritually removed from the community because of this disease. So Jesus' anger moved him to do something. Jesus was moved by anger. Righteous anger. When is the last time you can say, I was so angry about something in God's name that it moved me to do something? I so looked at a situation, whatever it is, And I was so moved by anger, I did something about it. I seeked God first, good connotation. I asked God the question, and I allowed him to help me. I said, you know, I've actually sat there and said, God, I am, this is not me saying this, you should be in your own head saying this. God, I am so upset and angry about this. This shouldn't be here. This is not part of your original plan for this society or for this world. What do you want me to do? And then when you think you've heard God, go and test it with somebody who's willing to challenge you. And say, actually, that's not your anger. That's your anger, not God's anger. It's also a very fine line. You'll know when it's God's anger because it's not about you. But here, Jesus was moved with anger. And he reached out and he touched the man. He touched a man with leprosy. Big no-no. That just made him ritually unclean. It actually contaminated Jesus in human eyes. It's a rabbi as well. Goodness me, he couldn't have gone into the synagogue and taught. That was the Jewish thinking. Jesus as the rabbi would have been contaminated by by the leper the minute he touched the man. But actually, here, it's the other way around. Jesus contaminates the man with holiness. 
and therefore the man becomes clean. Again, Jesus does this in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now here's the point. There have been periods in church history, and I think there's latent thinking in some our thinking, that actually shut the doors to the church, don't let the world contaminate it. Don't allow those people of other religion into this country. They will contaminate our Christian beliefs. Here we have it the other way around. Why is it that we, through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, are not able to contaminate them? With Jesus' holiness. Why is it that we think that we forget that the power, he who is in us is greater than he is in the world. So when we walk out to go and reclaim ground and restore hope, we are contaminating them with Jesus. Why is it going to be in our heads? And it is. Let's be honest. Oh, oh, they're more. Oh, dear. Mm. We contaminate them. If we are to reclaim ground for Jesus' sake and his name, for his kingdom and his glory, we've got to get our mindset that he who lives in us is greater than he who is in the world. So therefore then when you go out, you, we, us, contaminate them. When you walk into your workplace, when you walk into your college or cafe or whatever else it is you go, you are going in and taking Jesus in to contaminate them not the other way around hearing a, I don't know why this is on my mind hearing a swear word doesn't contaminate you I don't know why that's on I don't care if I hear a swear word I've spent 20 plus years in the car game trust me you hear it all the time but it never bothered me because it was like and when they discovered, oh, yeah, here you go. And when they, somebody said to me, I noticed you never swear. That's Jesus contaminating them. When you read that here, notice Jesus contaminated back with his holiness. And then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Now, let's get this right. Don't tell anyone was the stern warning. Stern isn't enough here. No English translation has got the word right. Because we don't like the idea of this. It's almost, in the Hebrew, snorting. Jesus snorts at the man and flares his nostrils. Don't you dare. Oh, we don't like that, do we? Jesus was given a right command. It was a infirm. It wasn't just. I'm, I'm just going to say to you, uh, just, just don't go and tell anyone. Is that okay? Thanks. It was don't tell anyone what has just happened. This is what you now need to go and do. It's a command, and he sends him on his way. Actually, the term here is a strong term. Same term used for expelling demons. It's almost like, and he sent the man packing. In other words, this is what you'll do. You will now go and do what you're meant to do in, by Moses' law to bring yourself restored. Do not do anything else. Do not deviate. You go from here to there. Do nothing else. Talk to no one else. It's that sort of thing. It's almost like a, yeah, it's, it's an army. It's a commander giving one of his recruits a command. I mean, no, I've never been in the army, but I'm sure there's been in the army. You would never disobey your commanding officer, would you? You would do exactly what you've been told. If he says go from A to B, that's what you'll do. And this is that sort of command. We don't like the idea of Jesus being like this. Jesus is a warm and cuddly, isn't he? I wasn't angry with the man, but it was a command. Don't muck about. 
Why? Well, Jesus, again, needs to ensure that his identity as Messiah is still guarded. He doesn't want it being misinterpreted and hindering his ministry. Because we're thinking, surely Jesus wants everybody to know what he's done here. It's good news, isn't it? No, he doesn't want a misunderstanding yet. And he also has a high regard for Moses' law, clearly. What's prescribed is that to cure a leper, to get them reintegrated back into community that a leper who's been healed must go to the priest and actually it's only the priest in writing can declare that a person is clean and therefore then is fully restored back into the community. He's got to give right sacrifices and I'm not going to go into those now but he's then allowed and fully reinstated into right relationship with the community and God and only the priest of the temple could actually declare that. And this is what Jesus wanted him to do. Go and do what has to be done. But verse 45, the man went and spread the word. He obeyed Jesus. Oh, no, he didn't. He goes off, doesn't obey Jesus, goes off on his emotions, not on what has been told for him to do. His emotions got better of the command of God. Now, don't get me wrong, I can understand exactly where the bloke's coming from. I've been an outcast from society, had to go around shouting unclean, unclean, unclean. I've suddenly come across this guy that I had a bit of faith for. This geezer's healed me. I'm fully healed. I can go back to my family, back to my friends, back to my work, back to my business, whatever. I'm back in. Hallelujah. So I could imagine, I want to go screaming around telling everybody. But that is emotion, enthusiasm, overriding a command from the Lord. And I love this. You've got this pleading, humble man going, please clean me. Gets cleaned and then he becomes complacent and it turns into disregard. All in the blink of an eye. How many times have we gone up and prayed before God? Oh, please sort this out, Lord. Oh, please sort this out. And you've, you've really humbled yourself fully. You know you spend time in a situation completely humbling yourself. And then God sorts it out and you give it a, oh, thanks very much, Lord. And then you go on back on. And after a while, within a few days, you're back to being complacent. We allow our emotions to override. I want here within Mark to make two different responses. To both healings. One, Peter's mother-in-law. Her response, get up, get on, serve. This man's response, don't do what he's commanded, go off and tell everybody else. Which one are you? Which one am I? And there's irony here, as he said, Mark uses irony so often. Jesus, by his actions, got the man included back into society. The man's lack of obeying Jesus has driven Jesus to the outside of the community. See that at the end? As a result of what this man did, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. So it's good that people kept coming to him, but Jesus probably thought, I just want to be able to go in and preach the good news. What were they coming to see, Jesus? Not for what he had to say, but for the miracles. They wanted to almost be like the man. Get their two-minute fix. I've been sorted. Right, and back on with my life as I want it to be. Come to church. Get me three hours fixed with God, and then go out for the other six half days of the week and do what I want to do. It's a bit of a broad brush stroke, I recognise that. But just note that. 
we would have thought what this man wanted to do was a good thing, proclaiming what Jesus had done for him. But I come back to this last quote. Just because something seems a good thing to you doesn't mean it's a God thing to do. Just because something seems a good thing to you doesn't mean it's a God thing to do. Let us pray. Father, I want to pray for each of us here, and I very much include myself in this, that we are people that are wanting to do what you want us to do. We're open to you using us in, in the gifts of healing for the other people. We're open, Lord, to be moved by your anger for situations that should not exist. We are moved by your angry compassion that we pray, pray, and act as well. But Lord, I also pray that we are people who do what you want us to do. Not run on our passions, not run on our emotions, but run on our obedience and love and gratefulness for you in the name of Jesus Amen We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation to learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv